2 Timothy chapter 3, 2 Timothy chapter 3. Now, this is the second week in our fre- frequently asked question sermon series. What happens is, is the, uh, the leadership of our church, we're, we're constantly being asked questions over time, and, and, and we're constantly being you know, put in positions where we have to answer them, sometimes in the middle of Walmart, sometimes in the middle of Dollar General, sometimes in the middle of Dollar Tree, we're having to answer these. And so Don and I were just praying and thinking about it, and we was like, well, how about we just answer them in large groups, right? So that we can answer some of the, the tough questions, some of the questions that people aren't, uh, that aren't having their questions answered. And so that's what this whole sermon series is about, is we're trying to answer the questions that, that maybe you've always wanted to ask, but never had the courage to ask, right? And so that's what this is all about. I would encourage you, if you missed last week's Sunday, uh, sermon, uh, look it up. It's on our website, Facebook. There should be plenty of ways for you to find it. If you don't, text me and I will email you the link so that you can watch it. Because I will say this, if you're going to get mad about something, at least get mad about something you've seen, right? If you're going to get mad about something that you've heard me say, how about you actually hear me say it? Does that sound like a great idea? And in fact, that leads us to this fact that I want to start our sermon off today. The fact is this, everybody likes God's word and until it applies to them. Everybody likes God's word until it applies to them. You do realize that the Bible is still the number one selling book in the history of mankind. It's still one of the top sellers, even in our day and age today. And if you walked up to the average person, you said, hey, you like the Bible? They'd be like, yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. I love the Bible, right? Until the Bible starts messing with them. Until the Bible tells them to stop doing something or start doing something, right? In fact, we see it here in 2 Kings 17, 13 through 14. It said, God said, turn from your sinful ways and obey my laws, but the people would not listen. They were stubborn. What had happened? God had spoke the truth. He, he had shared his word, and they were like, eh don't want to do it. Now, I guarantee it that they, these same people love Deuteronomy 28, 6. It says, wherever you go and whatever you do, you will be blessed. Now, they love that verse. They just didn't like the turn from your sins, turn from your wicked ways, and get right with Jesus verse, right? And so again, it goes back to our fact, everybody loves the Word of God, everybody loves the Bible, until it starts messing in their Cheerios. In fact, I think again of last week's message, intense criticism. Why? Because I'm here to tell you, you might want to write this down, it's not going to be on a slide, it's not going to be on a sheet, but you might want to write this down. If you decide to be biblical, write this down if you want to, if you decide to be biblical, you're going to make everybody mad. If you decide to be biblical, you're going to make everybody mad. Last week, all I did, I had so much yellow on that insert last week. There were so many Bible verses I gave y'all last week about what God says about alcohol, right? All I did was try to present what uh, my professor used to say, the whole counsel of the Word of God. He said it in a better, better voice than me. But basically what I tried to do last week is tell you what the Bible says about alcohol from Genesis to the maps, okay? And guess what I did? I made the people who don't drink mad because I said that, Christians can drink. I made the people who get drunk mad because I said Christians can't get drunk. And so basically I made everybody mad, right? And this is what happened. Now the good things was this. By the way, y'all are such great people. I love y'all so much. You're so good to me. I started getting texts. I started getting Facebook messages. I started getting word telling me, thank you, preacher. I appreciate that, preacher. Thank you. Y'all have been so encouraging to me this week. In fact, you know what? Most of them, most of the texts, most of the Facebook messages, most of the words of encouragement I've got have been from women. Women saying, preacher, thank you for telling me what the word of God says. Randy, thank you for being honest enough to tell us the truth about alcohol in the South. But here's what I was thinking. Every time, because I knew where God was taking me today, and every time I got a text, Facebook message, or a word of encouragement from, from a mom or from a, a wife or from a, from a lady, I was sitting there thinking, well, I wonder what they're going to think about this week. Because again, you know what, who liked my sermon last week? People who like to drink. Right? Now here we go. Today, the question we need to ask, because again, I was just asked this not too long ago by one of you, is what is God's plan for women? What is God's plan for women? And and here's the thing. Before we even start looking at God's plan on anything, we need to be reminded of this truth. And the truth is this. All of God's plans for us are for our good. 
all of God's plans for us are for our good. Jeremiah 29, 11 says what? I know what I am planning for you, says the Lord. I have good plans for you, not plans to hurt you. I will give you hope and a good future. And so anytime you hear somebody stand up and they try to reveal to you what God's plan is for a particular area of your life or a particular person in your life, you need to be reminded that God's plans for you are good. When somebody when somebody talks to your teenager and says, hey, don't have sex before marriage, what God's plan is for sex to stay within marriage. He's wanting to bless your teenager. He's wanting to help your teenager. He's wanting to give your teacher, your teenager a great future and a hope. And so what is God's plan for women? Now, here's the bad part about this. Right now, there's two women for every one man in this building right now. So I am so glad that I've learned to run. (laughs) Because some of you right now, you probably want to go by my door on the way out. Because you're going to be mad, and you're going to go by Jason's door, because Jason has good hair, and he's sweet, and he's nice, and he's kind, and everything like that. And you're not even going to go by my door. Let me go ahead and tell you. Can I tell you something before you get mad at me? I love you. I love you enough to tell you the truth, even if it makes you mad at me. Listen, I love you enough to tell you the truth, even if I lose you forever. I've always told people, you need that one person in your life that's going to tell you the truth, even if it makes you mad. I volunteer. I'm going to tell you the truth. And so let's look at 2 Timothy chapter 3, beginning with... Verse 14, and let's see what God's plan is for women. We see, first of all, he's, this is Paul talking to Timothy. He says, but you must remain faithful to the things you have been taught. You know they are true, for you know you can trust those who taught you. You have been taught the Holy Scriptures from childhood, and they have given you the wisdom to receive the salvation that comes by trusting Christ Jesus. Verse 16 says this, all Scripture, I don't line that word all, All Scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our life. It corrects us when we are wrong and teaches us to do what is right. God uses His Word to prepare and equip His people to do every good work. Now do me a favor, go back to verse 16 and look what it says. It says what? Does it say some Scripture? Does it say the Scriptures that you like? Does it say that scriptures that talk about lovey-dovey stuff and, oh, God wants to bless you, God just cares for you, he all he wants? Is it, is it just those scripture? Or does it say all scriptures? It says all scripture is what? It is inspired. That word inspired literally means, you might want to write it out beside it in your Bible, it means God breathed. It means God breathed it into the hearts and the minds of the people that he used to write these scriptures. He says that all scripture is what? It can teach us what is true. It can make us realize what is wrong. It corrects us, prepares us, and equips us for the good life. You're saying, Randy, what in the wild world of sports has this got to do with women? I don't see a single verse in there about women. Well, first of all, you need to understand what is he saying there when he says all scripture. When he talks about you know it's true. What's he saying? He's saying, hey, you can trust God's plan for your life. Ladies, you can trust God's plan for you. But what you might not notice is, guess what? The whole context of verses 14 and 15 is in 2 Timothy 1.5, where Paul says, I remember your genuine faith, for you share the faith that first filled your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice. What's we, what do we see there is that Timothy was raised by a godly grandma. He was raised by a godly mama. And that leads us to the first part of God's plan for women. And that is God's plan for women in the home. God's plan for women in the home. 2 Timothy 3, 5 says this, You have been taught the Holy Scriptures from childhood by your mama and your grandmama. What's he saying there? He's saying that Miss Lois and Miss Eunice understood and accomplished God's plan for moms. You're saying, Randy, what is God's plan for mom? Look at your sheet. God's plan for moms is to train their children to follow the Bible. God's plan for every mother in this building today is for them to train their children to obey the Bible. You're saying, where do you get that? Proverbs 22, 6 says this, train a child in the way he should go, and even when he is old, he will not turn away from it. You're saying, Randy, what do you mean by that word train? Let me give you the definition of the word train. It is to encourage someone to choose God's good and flee from the devil's bad. It is to encourage someone to choose God's good and to flee the devil's bad. You see, God knows this. God knows that every day your children are faced with a choice. 
Do I do what the Bible says or do I do what's easy? And it's the mother's job to train her children to, first of all, they got to know the Bible. So by the, what does that mean to you, Mom? That means you need to read the Bible, right? Just going to leave that there. The, you're, you're to teach your children the Bible and then encourage them to do good and discourage the bad in them. I know you hate this, but the, the analogy is like a puppy. How do we train our puppies to do the things that God wants them to do? We encourage the good, and we discourage the bad. And this is what frustrates me about some of you moms. You, some of you moms are constantly telling me, I can't teach my kid to do nothing. I can't train my kid to do nothing. And I'm sitting here thinking, I have trained my dog not to bark, and you're trying to tell me you can't train your children to say hey when somebody says hey? I believe your children are smarter than my dog. I have a very high view of your children. And so you need to stop saying they can't and start saying they better. Because it is the mother's job to train their children to follow the Bible. Now, in 1989, when I started in ministry, I never once thought there would be a day that I would have to remind churchgoers of something. But guess what? The day has come. And so please remember this. Remember this, that God's plan is marriage first and children second. God's plan is for marriage first and children second. Malachi 2.15 says this, God made husbands and wives to become one body and one spirit for his purpose so that they would have children who are true to God. What's he saying there? He's saying that God is an orderly God and that he has set this universe up to run in such a way that, guess what, if you do certain things at the right time, at the right place, things are going to go better for you. And what God has determined and what God has decided is this. And again, we have a whole generation that does not know this. Moms, help me out. Fathers, help me out. we got a whole generation out there that do not know that God wants you to become a wife first before you become a mom. You're saying, Randy, you just hate single moms. Are you kidding me? Have you seen the number of single moms I've got around here? I love single moms. You want to know why? Because they're all alone. They're trying to do the job of two people with one person. But you know what? Many of you know I've been divorced. And some of you love to walk up to me and tell me, God hates divorce. Well, you know what? I hate divorce too because I've been through it. I have yet to see a single mom that doesn't say to me, man, I could use some help. And man, it would be better if I had a godly husband who helped me raise these children. And so we need to reestablish that God's plan is for good. God's plan is for best. And that leads us to the next question. What is God's plan for wives? God's plan for wives is this, to follow the lead of their husbands. To follow the lead of their husbands. Ephesians 5.22 says this, Wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord. What's the definition of submit? It means to surrender to another's path. You're saying, what in the world do you mean by that? Well, let me help you out here. It's a military term. Write that out beside it. The word submit is a military term. And what it means is this. If you are a private, if you are a sergeant, you're going to do what your commanding officers tell you to do if you're going to be in submission, if you're going to be right in the military. I'll give you an example. When my son went into the Navy, many of you know my son went into the Navy. This is what he said. He said, Randy, Daddy, all I want to do is I want to be stationed in Europe so I can just see the sights and the sounds of Europe. Guess what his commanding officer said? Joshua, have fun in Japan. <laughs> and so if Joshua is going to be in submission to his commanding officer and not go AWOL and disobedience and all the bad things that are going to happen to him, his job is to say, you know what, I wanted to go to Europe, but I'm going to head to Japan. And the same is true with wives. Now, remember this real quick. Is there anything intrinsically, inwardly better about Joshua's commanding officer than Joshua? No! They are both equally valuable in the sight of God. God loves them both the same. Jesus died for both of them. The only difference is in rank. Well, the same is true with wives and their husbands. There is not a man in here that says that he's better than his wife. He's not better. He just has a different rank in the family structure that God has called him to do. And by the way, ladies, can I tell you something? 
Jesus modeled how you're supposed to live. Notice what Luke chapter 2, verse 51 says. It says, Jesus went down with his parents, and he came to Nazareth, and he did as he was ordered. Underline that word order. That is the same Greek word as submit. That's the same concept as submit. And what happened is Jesus said, you know what? Mom, Dad, I am the, uni- I am the God of this universe. I am the center of this universe, but you are my parents. I'm going to do what you say. By the way, his submission did not start here on earth. Look at what Philippians 2, 6, and 7 says. It said, though Jesus was God, he did not think of equality with Father God as something to cling to. Instead, he became a servant. You see, Jesus knew that he was God. He knew that he was equal with God the Father, but he said, you know what? I am going to humble myself. I am not going to demand my rights. I know I'm equal with him. He's in charge. I'm not. And you know what, ladies? Ladies? God is just asking you to be like Jesus in your home. And so my question for you is this. Are you following God's plan for your home? As you flip your notes over, you do understand that God's plan for your home, it's good. And can I share something with you? Some of you have tried your way and it's not working. How about you just be crazy enough, you just be humble enough to say, you know what, I'm going to do it God's way, and then let's see what happens. Some of you moms right now are so mad at your children because they are rebelling against you, but my question for you is this, are they learning rebellion from you as you rebel against your husband? Are you following God's plan for your home. Why? Because not only does he have a plan for your home, notice secondly that God has a plan for women in church. God has a plan for women in church. 1 Timothy 2.12 simply says, I do not let women teach men or have authority over them. Go ahead and mutter. Go ahead and just, I know you're thinking it. But whether we like it or not, and we can argue all we want to, that's like arguing if the sky is blue, that's like arguing if grass is green, and I know some of you will argue with the sky about whether it's blue or not, and some of you will argue with the grass as to whether it's green or not, but whether we like it or not, it is God's plan for men to lead his church. So does that mean that women have no place? Are you kidding me? Look at your sheet. Let's look at God's plan for all women in church all women in church all women in church are to help those in need and share the good news they are to help those in need and share the good news proverbs 31 20 through 21 says a godly woman extends a helping hand to the poor and opens her arms to the needy philippians 4 3 says this these women fought beside me to spread the good news what's the good news he's talking about how do you and i get to heaven what's the good news he's talking about how god can save somebody like you and turn them into a saint of god that can live with them in heaven forever that's the good news and what god is saying is that guess what every single woman in here whether you're a women's minister or not every single woman in this church has the responsibility to help those in need and guess what to share god's plan on how people get to heaven she's gonna get mad at me that's why you heard me strutter there for a little bit but i i think of debbie Coble. i know she just won the tea, uh, the, the cheesecake factory and y'all think whatever can i tell you what debbie i've known her for six seven years deb and this is what debbie always says If there's a need, I'll meet it. Been around her? Can I get an amen on that? If there's a need, I'll meet it. Why? Because she recognizes what God's plan for her in the church. Now you're saying, Randy, what's God's plan for women leaders in the church? Does God allow for women leadership in the church? Absolutely. His plan for women leaders is to serve God by serving their church leaders and to lead women and children to live biblically. You're saying, what do you mean by that? Well, Romans 16, 1 through 2, he says, the same guy, by the way, that says you can't have a, women can't have authority over men, the same guy says, I commend to you our sister Phoebe, who is a deacon, underline that word deacon, who is a deacon in the church, for she has been helpful to many, especially to me. This is where I'm going to make some of you mad. Randy, you're saying, Randy, do you have women deacons here at Freedom Family Church? Yeah, you want to know why? Because they're in the Bible. And you're really trying to tell me I'm supposed to forbid something that God permits? Are you kidding me? 
Notice what Titus 2.4 says. It says, Older women must train the younger women to love their husbands and their children, to live wisely and be pure, to work in their homes and to do good, and to be submissive to their husbands. And all, uh, the women leaders are also to join the psalmist in Psalm 34.11. It says, Come, children, listen to me. I will teach you to fear, teach you the fear of the Lord. And again, by the way, all this is based upon who? That Jesus guy. Notice what Mark 10, 45 says. It says, even Jesus came not to be served, but to serve others. By the way, you want to know why Tammy Kimry is our women deacon? You want to know why she leads our women's ministry? I've known her for years, and this is what she says to me every time I see her. She says, what do you need? What do you need? Well, Tammy, I need you to do this. Okay. Well, Tammy, I need you to do this. Okay. Tammy understands that the more she becomes like Jesus, the more she serves God by serving her leaders and helping the women and the children of this church grow biblically. And so my question for you is this. Are you willing to obey God even when the world says you're crazy? Are you willing to obey God even when the world says you're crazy? Will you trust his plan for your home? Will you trust his plan for your church? But notice there's also a third plan. God's, we need to know God's plan for women in our culture. We need to know God's plan for women in our culture. Galatians 3.28 says this, There is no longer Jew or Gentile, slave or free, male or female, for you are all one, underline that word one, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Can I tell you something that you will not ever hear on CNN? You're definitely not going to hear it on Fox News or PMS, NBC. You're never going to hear this anywhere. But can I, I read an article, one of those boring historical with you know, notes at the end that verifies what it says. I read an article the other day about everywhere that biblical Christianity has been practiced, the lives of women have been blessed. You do realize before biblical Christianity came along, women were considered subpar. They were considered subhuman. And yet where biblical Christianity is practiced, the, the lives and the, and the roles of women has been elevated. If you don't believe me, do, do something dangerous. Google pictures of women in Muslim countries. Read about the mutilation that is done by them, the forced rapes that is done by them. Read about how women in countries that have thrown off Jesus, have thrown off God's word, read about how they're abused and destroyed and manipulated. And then maybe, just maybe, you might be a little bit appreciative of how God has blessed you to be an American. You see, everywhere Christianity has been practiced, women have been Blessed. You're saying, well, Randy, what's God's plan for all women in our culture? God's plan for all women in our culture is to fear God and to reveal his grace to others. Every woman in our culture's job is to fear God and to reveal his grace to others. Proverbs 31.30 is one of my favorite verses. It says, charm is deceptive and beauty does not last, but a woman who fears the Lord will be greatly praised. Some of you want to be praised for how your hair looks today. Good job. Some of you want to be praised about that nice new outfit that you got. Good job. Let me tell you who I want to praise. I want to praise you for your godliness. I want to praise you because you're free from sin. You're saying, Randy, why do people keep telling me that I need to fear God? Look at Exodus 20.20. 20. He says, your fear of God will keep you from sinning. You don't want to know why you keep sinning? You want to know why you keep doing the stupid things that you're doing? Because you do not fear God. And God wants every woman in our culture to fear him. Why? So that their lives will not be destroyed by sin. But notice what Proverbs eleven sixteen says. It says, a gracious woman gains honor. Every woman I've talked to has this desire that, to want to be honored. Well, you want to be honored? Be gracious. What's the definition of graciousness? Look, the definition of graciousness is to treat others the way God treats us. To treat others the way God treats us. And so what we see there when those two verses is that God wants his women to be free from sin so that they can represent him to a lost and a hurting world. Think about this for a second. I'm going to do a little experiment here. Think about the women that you are drawn to. Think about it. Are you drawn to mean women? Are you drawn to hateful women? Are you drawn to ugly women? Leave that alone, men. Don't say nothing. 
But I, I, I just thought back to all the women in my life that I've been drawn to like a magnet. And you know what it is? It's those who are gracious, those who are quick to forgive, quick to love, those who try to treat others the way God has graciously treated them. Ladies, you want to be honored? You want to be loved? You want to be liked? Then choose now to not be like your, maybe your grandmama was or your mama was or your aunt was, but decide today to be like Jesus. And you'll be fulfilling God's plan for your life. But notice, what is God's plan for women leaders in our culture? You're saying, Randy, we can't have women leaders in our culture. Are you kidding me? Look at your sheet. God's plan for women leaders in our culture is to use your talents and gifts to impact the community. To use your talents and gifts to impact their community. Notice what Proverbs 31, 16 through 18 says. By the way, write this down if you're a lady here. Read Proverbs 31. Good chapter. Okay, Proverbs 31, 16 through 18 says this, a godly woman picks out a field and buys it. She plants a vineyard from the profits she has earned. She puts on strength like a belt and goes to work with energy. She sees that she is making a good profit. Now, does that sound like a doormat to you? Does that sound like somebody just sits in their home and says, oh, just whatever my husband wants me to do, I'm just going to sit here until my preacher comes by and tells me what the... Does that sound like that to you? It's so funny because I've always had a biblical perspective of women. And everywhere I've gone, God has surrounded me by strong women. You want to know why? Because my mama's a strong woman. Opinionated, brassy, if, you don't like, if, you don't, if she doesn't like what you're wearing, she will tell you. She's the only one in, in, in 16 years of preaching that has sat right there and told me that I'm wrong from the chair. While I'm preaching! But you know what? She submits to her husband. And she did train her children, and she followed the leadership of her church, and she taught women, every woman's Sunday school class that she taught, they kept having to divide it and split it. Why? Because she'd have 40, 50, 60 women in her Sunday school class. She understood God's plan for her life. Notice what Judges 3, 4, and 5 says. It says, Deborah, the wife of Shaquille O'Neal, was a prophet. She was the judge in Israel at that time. Don't ask me to say that name. I don't know what that name is. But do you see the big picture? Do you, are you getting it? Because some of you right now, you're so mad at me, you're not thinking. Help me, pull back. Pull back with me, ladies. Do you see the big picture? When she's strengthened and protected by her submission at home and church, God uses women to rock the world. Do you see that? Strengthened by their submission at home and in church, protected by their submission at home and in church, God uses a godly woman to rock the world. But some of you, you got it backwards. All you want to do is you want to control and manipulate and bully in home. You want to control and manipulate and bully in church. And then you wonder why you have no impact. You wonder why you have no influence. And God says, get it right. Get the order right. Humble yourself in your home, lady. Humble yourself at church, lady. And I will exalt you. I will lift you up. And the whole world will know your name. You'll impact the community for Christ. You see, one of my heroes of the faith. I know some of you already labeled me as a male chauvinist pig. That's okay. But one of my heroes of the faith is Ann Graham Lotz. You know who I'm talking about? It's Billy Graham's daughter. One of my heroes. And I still remember. By the way, the Bible says that God will take part of his spirit off of one person and put it on another. Okay? Billy Graham is the greatest preacher that's ever lived. Bar none. Billions of people have heard this man. And I heard his son preach one time, and I was all excited, and I was like, Yay, Billy Graham's son! Woo! And I was disappointed. But one night, I was at the North Carolina Baptist Convention, and Ann Graham Lott stood up and spoke about, Just give me Jesus. And I thought I was going to die. It was so powerful. It was so real. It was right where I needed to be. And God used that woman to bless me in ways that I can never imagine. By the way, she humbled herself to her husband until he died. 
She humbled herself to her daddy and her church until, and, and, and she still does today. But now she, God has lifted her up and exalted her and used her. In fact, she's going to encourage you right now. I got a video. I want to just real quick, but she's got a video I want to play of where she talks about the importance of women sharing the gospel. Go ahead and play the video. Dim the lights for me a little bit. And I wonder about the children within your own home, your grandchildren. And I just want to fire you up that we need to tell them when they're young. We need to get them before the devil does. <laughs> we need to share the gospel when they'll listen to us. So get fired up. I believe there are people all around us that need Jesus. And I believe there are people around us who would come to Jesus if they knew how, if they knew had, had somebody to tell them, somebody who would tell them with love, not judgment like, you need Jesus, you know, but, but let me share what Jesus has done for me. And when you're going through this hard time, he can give you strength and comfort and hope, and that's what he's done for me. Let me tell you what he's done for me. And, and you make it winsome and inviting. Does that sound like a doormat? Does that sound like a, a pushover? Some of you are saying, well, Randy, I can't do that. Are you sure? Are you sure? Because again, I'm challenging you. Humble yourself within your home. Follow the lead of your husband, even when he's a knucklehead. I get it. He is. I am. Follow your church leaders. This is what I tell women all the time. When you submit as unto the Lord, you know what God says? God says, you know what? They may be knuckleheads and idiot, but I'm going to bless you for your humility. And then when that happens, because you are secure, you are strengthened, you are protected, God may raise you up. And I know he wants to impact liberty. I know he wants to impact your neighborhood. I know he wants to impact people through you. But you got to get the order right. And so my question for you is this. Will you set aside fear and let God use you to change the world? Will you set aside fear and let God use you to change your world? Will you humble yourself in some places so that God can lift you up in others? Oh, let's talk to the Lord about it. Bow your heads and close your eyes. Every head bow. Every eye closed. You're saying, Randy, you keep talking about humility. You, humility, humility. I keep hearing that. Why? This humility thing is a big deal. Because you know how I want to, you know, I, every Sunday I try to share the good news about how you can get to heaven. I want to share the good news how God can give you a new heart and a new life. I want to share the good news of how Jesus can change you from the inside out. You know the key to that good news? Humility. You've got to acknowledge that you are a sinner. That takes humility. You've got to acknowledge that you need to change. That takes humility. You've got to acknowledge that only Jesus can fix you. That takes humility. And then you've got to do the crazy things that Romans talks about where you've got to call upon the name of the Lord. Cry out to him and say, I can't fix this. I can't change this. I can't do this. And that takes humility. I'm scared for some of you. Because you won't humble yourself before God about anything. And if that's the case, have you been saved? Or did you cry out to God and say, God, I know you want to save me. God, I know I'm awesome and wonderful and perfect in every way. And so, God, I know it's your privilege to take me to heaven when I die. Well, guess what? If that's what you prayed or something like that, you're going to hell. The Bible says God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. So I wonder, have you been humbled today? The reason why you're in here is because God's brought you through a season of humility. Are you humble today? Are you ready to call out to him and say, I don't care what anybody thinks. I need me some Jesus. I am in such a strait. I am such a sinner that only Jesus can fix me. Are you there? Because if you are in just a few seconds, I'm going to pray a simple prayer. And if you'll pray this prayer with me to God, then, then you can be forgiven, you can be given a new heart and life, and you get to go to heaven when you die. How about that, Apple? You're saying, well, Randy, I don't know how to talk to God. That's why I'm praying with you. You're saying, well, Randy, do I need to pray out loud? I want you to. Why? 
Because I, there's going to be a day where the devil tries to trick you into thinking that you aren't saved. And if you say it out loud, you'll have that reminder. Plus, I also want you to say it out loud. Why? Because there's somebody around you that needs to hear your testimony. They need to hear your humility. They need to follow your example. So would you pray with me right now? Would you just pray? Dear Jesus, I'm a sinner. Please forgive me of my sin. Come into my heart. Be my Savior and Lord. And Jesus, help me to live for you. It's in your name I ask.